Saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in this excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus has fled. Hello everybody, this is Pastor Andrew, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Church in the Word. Tonight I'm at my kitchen table, and we are going to do another ideal Bible reader. A few years ago, I used a couple tools I had in my office from books and things I've studied to come up with five questions to, that I ask myself when I'm studying the Bible, and I encourage my church to ask as we study the Bible in different passages and these five questions allow us to understand its application to our lives, understand the context, context it's in, 
and allows us to uh, dig deeper into the Word of God. You see, meditation for many of us simply means emptying our minds. We think of the, the guy that sits with his legs crossed and his hands up and going, um, with the hope of getting rid of everything in his mind. But the Bible speaks of meditation as filling our minds with the Word of God. Actually, the Bible says if we do this, we are blessed. We're like a tree planted by streams of water. We bear fruit in all seasons. And so I came up with five, or I should say borrow five, or, or formulated five questions that help us understand the Bible, help us understand the text that we're reading. And I call it the ideal Bible reader because these five questions help us meditate on the Word of God. And the scriptures say if we meditate on the Word of God, we are blessed. So the five questions we have are, what words stand out to me? Is there any repetition in this passage? If so, why do you I think it's repeated? What is this passage trying to tell me? Is there another place in the Bible that communicates the same truth? And how does this apply to my life? So we did this a few weeks ago, and tonight we're going to do one more. 1 John chapter 1, verse uh, 9. Um, not 19, that's a mistake on my page. Verse 9. And if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Uh, if you have your Bible app, you can open it up. And we're going to look at the book of 1 John, uh, chapter 1, verse 19. Now, or verse 9, sorry, not 19, verse 9. There's no verse 19 in chapter 1. Now, when I was going to university at Tyndale, uh, we were required, if we're in the ministry uh, degree, to take so many text and interpretation courses. That was uh, a course where we would study one book of the Bible or, or one theme of the Bible or, or one author of the biblical books. And uh, I took one year the Johannine Epistles, which are the letters, the three letters written by John uh, in the New Testament, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And I have to say it was one of my most favorite classes and favorite things to study when I was at Tyndale, I found that John uh, knew so much of the Old Testament, knew so much of his culture, and was able to weave those two together. And uh, it's one of the things that when you read his gospel, when you read his letters, and when you read the book of Revelation, it gets richer and richer every time you read because there are things you never noticed before that the Holy Spirit points out to you. So we're going to read uh, just this one verse, decided to do one verse again tonight, and we're going to read 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. There's no 19, that is a spelling error, and uh, this is an error I said a few minutes ago. One verse, verse number 9. It's on the screen here, I have the screen split, and so let's look at uh, this verse together. I'm going to read it through twice so that we can uh, just get a good grasp of it before we ask the questions. John writes to the Christians and he says this, But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Let's read it again. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. What a powerful verse. What a powerful verse for your life and my life. So let's dig into it. Like always, I have my pen. I have my highlighter. I have a different color pen to underline something or circle something. And so the first question causes us to examine the text. What words stand out to me? So I want you in the comment section below to write uh, any words or any phrases from this text tonight that stands out to you. I'm going to circle a few that stand out to me. The first one that stands out to me is this word, confess. That one really stands out to me tonight. Uh, faithful and righteous and cleansing. Those four words as I read through this and prepared for this study really stood out to me. It, those almost seem to jump off the page. Maybe it's where I am in my life. Maybe it's something the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to me. But these words stood out. And maybe these are the same words that stood out to you. Maybe there is another word that stood out to you. There's no wrong answer in this. Uh, so comment below the different words that stood out to you. And these are the, the four that stood out to me. Now, I've had the advantage of kind of preparing a little bit for this study so that I can help walk us through this. 
But the first word I want to look at that I've studied, studied a little bit is the word confess. Now, confession, we've heard, is good for the soul, and that's true. Because this text says if we confess our sins, we receive forgiveness. Now, the first thing I want you to notice about the word confess, and, and I looked it up in my app on my phone. We live and breathe these phones, and, and many times it can be a distraction, but many times they can also be good. And so I encourage you to use the Bible app, to use applications on your phone to help you study your Bible if you get stuck. I have this wonderful Bible app that has the English uh, versus the original Greek or Hebrew, depending if you're in the Old or New Testament. And then you can click on the word and it gives you the meaning of the word and how many times it's used and such. And I think this was a free app on the uh, Google Play Store for my phone. So there's lots of apps and lots of things you can download to help your Christian walk and help you understand the Bible better. But this word confess, the first thing I want you to notice about this word, I'll use a blue pen for this so it comes up better on the screen is this is an action. To confess means to have an action of declaring publicly. It's a public, I'll put public, I'll put deck for declaration. It's a public declaration. You are speaking something out. You are making something known. Uh, the word confession here uh, it gives the idea of of revealing something to someone else. Now, we as Christians believe that there is only one mediator. There's only one between between God and man. And the scriptures tell us that is Jesus Christ. And so we're here encouraged that if we confess our sins, if we make known our sins, then he, there's something that occurs in the spiritual life of a believer. Confession truly is good for the soul. And what I find so interesting is that, for example, in the New Testament, we learn about the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. Really, it was the disciples' prayer. And the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Master, teach us to pray like John has taught his disciples to pray. That's John the Baptist. And so Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. And you might have heard sermons before or even points in sermons that talk about that Jesus said, when you pray, not if you pray or in case you pray, but when you pray, it was a definitive. It was the idea that you will pray. Well, what we see in this verse here in the original language is that this is a word that speaks of an action that should take place in the believer's life. Uh, it, it could almost be translated, but, if, but when we confess our sins, uh, not but if we confess, but when we confess our sins. I want to remind you that confession is something that a Christian should do on a regular basis. And not in the way that we many times thought about confession of wringing our hands and being scared of God's reaction. When you're a child of God, when you first confess him as your Lord and your Savior, and you become saved and you're part of God's kingdom, he becomes your father. And he's a good father who gives his children good gifts. He's patient and kind and gracious and merciful. And so we confess to him, not out of fear, but out of love and, and looking for that mercy and looking for that restoration. And so when we look at this, confession really is not optional for the Christian. It, it, it's when we confess. Not but if, if we confess, but when we confess. The original Greek puts it in that such context that it's something that we should be doing on a regular basis. Confessing to him our faults, our failures. Confessing to him our sins. I don't know if for you now, I have my mug here today that Julia got me a few Christmases ago. You probably can't see it. Maybe you can. It says, Mr. Perfect. And, uh, it's my favorite mug to use in the house. But I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not perfect. And all it would take is to call Julia or my family and they would tell you, I'm not perfect. God knows I'm not perfect. Yet I want to confess those imperfections to him. Why? Because he is faithful and righteous. Now this word faithful, again, it, we hear that word so often. It's one of those churchy words that comes up quite often. And, and we faithful, you know, yes, yes, we understand what that means. But that word actually, it means to be trustworthy. Trustworthy. That we are able to trust him. 
And that only are we able to trust him, let he'll, he will hear us, trust him that he will love us, trust him that he's gracious, but he's righteous. Now, this is a major church word. This is a, you know, a, a, a phrase we hear a lot in church. But do you really know what it means? Righteous really is a, a, a word that comes from the judicial system, the, the courtroom, the, the judge, the lawyer, because righteous means judge and judgment. Righteous means he is the perfect person to cast a judgment, the perfect person to make a decision. What this is saying is that if we, not if we, when we confess our sins, he is trustworthy and has the right credentials. He's able to do what he says he's able to do. I don't know if you've ever encountered someone before that pretended they had the position that they had or had the power or the clout or the sway and they said, oh yes, I can do this or oh yes, I can do that. But really they couldn't. They didn't have the right credentials. Maybe you've been in a situation before where someone's promised you something. Oh, I can do this for you. But really in the end they couldn't because they didn't have the right credentials. They didn't have the right clearance. They never had the right sway or influence. But what we see here is that Jesus Christ, not only is he trustworthy, but he has the right credentials. He can make the perfect judgment. He has the ability to make the perfect judgment. And we see this later in the book of Revelation chapter 5, where the crowd of heaven says, who is worthy to open the scroll? And John cries because there is no one found worthy, but then the lamb is found worthy. He has the right credentials to open the scroll and see the things of God and begin the judgments of God because he is righteous. And in our own lives, we can have confidence that when we confess our sins, he's trustworthy. We can trust him. We know he's going to pull through and he's also righteous. He has the right credentials to make the best and proper decisions. Nothing that the Son of God had decided to do was counter to what the Father desired to do, nor what the Spirit desired to do. They are not in conflict, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in unity and cohesiveness in redemption, mercy, and grace. And this last word here, I won't spend much time on these words, but this last word here is cleansing. And uh, when we think of cleansing rightfully, we think of my terrible drawing of water. Water and cleansing was very important to the Jewish tradition. You think of the fact that they were requested to have ceremonial baths and wash themselves properly before going into the Holy of Holies. We think of the fact that the Pharisees got mad at the disciples of Jesus because they did not wash their hands properly. And so we see that the idea of cleansing of water, we see that in the scriptures actually, in, in John's letter, the, the cleansing of the water and the blood and, and, and the cleansingness of the idea that we are washed and purified and made whole. See, cleansing comes for purity and also refreshing. We have been given a refreshing, a fresh start, something new. We are, we are all our faults and failures, our sins are washed away because we've been cleansed by Jesus Christ. So those four words, they stand out to me. They kind of help me have a deeper understanding and appreciation for this text. Let's move to the next question. Are there any repetitions? If so, why do you think it is repeated? Well, there's only one phrase that's repeated for me that stands out to me. And it's this phrase. Our sins. Our sins. Hopefully you can see that there on the screen. Our sins. This is the... Uh, subject matter of this passage. This is the this is the reason John is writing this. And and if we read in verses before and after, we see that there's a, there's this problem in the early church that is still persistent today. When someone says, "I don't sin, I've never sinned. I'm a good person. There's nothing in me that requires forgiveness." You might be surprised, but there's a video online of a very public 
political figure in our world today, that when he's asked if he needs forgiveness, he never says yes. He skirts around the question and just says, I don't think I do anything that requires forgiveness. I try to act in a way that I don't need to ask for forgiveness. And he, he implies that he doesn't do anything wrong. He works hard in his life to not do anything wrong, and therefore he does not need forgiveness. But the reality is, is that John says, if we do not bear the guilt of sin, or we, or we say we don't bear the guilt of sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Hate to break it to you today, but you sin. And you might be shocked, but I sin too. Unlike this mug, I'm not Mr. Perfect. I have many faults and failures. And so in this text, the subject person is Jesus Christ, but the subject matter is my sin. If we confess our sin or my sin, he is trustworthy and has the right credentials to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. This is connected, of course. Unrighteousness is connected to my sin. I am found guilty in God's courtroom because of sin. And so we see this phrase, our sin, that's the subject matter. You can't read uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and not come to the reality that it's speaking about our sin, how we have a sin problem. And we can see this in the world today in some of the most unruly people, and we can see it in the world today from some of the most respected people. Each and every one of us has sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's redeemed us from sin. Jesus has cleansed us by trusting in him and his work upon the cross from all of our sin and unrighteousness. I think it's repeated because John is emphasizing the point that we are all sinners saved by grace. Number three, now we've kind of touched on this. I think the overall passage is trying to communicate to me that one, we have a sin problem. Everyone does. But two, we have a sin solution. Isn't that the good news of the gospel? I mean, to have good news of the gospel, it must first start with bad news. And the bad news is that you have a sin problem. And the good news is, but we have a sin solution. The work of Jesus Christ. I love what Peter said in his letter to the Christians. He says, we have not been redeemed by things that can perish, spoil, and fade like gold and silver and whatever else. You think of something, it's here today and gone tomorrow. But we have been bought with a price, bought and redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ like that of a spotless lamb. We see that there's a sin problem. And John makes this point. Our sin, our sin. Unrighteousness. But there's a sin solution. He is faithful and righteous and cleans us. Oh, isn't it good to know that he is the faithful one? Isn't it good to know that Jesus Christ is the righteous one? He's trustworthy. We can trust him. The old course is I can trust Jesus. He's also righteous. He has the right credentials to make the right decision. What's this passage trying to tell me? Everyone Oh, no, oh you can't see that. I'll just draw a little uh, a little sad face because it's a sin problem. But then there's the sin solution. Jesus Christ upon the cross. Number four, is there another place in the Bible that communicates the same truth? This is an important question to ask, and I like asking this question. You see, the word Bible means library. Did you know that? Think of the French word bibliothèque. That's the French word for library. The idea of a Bible is that it's a collection of holy books. 
It's a collection of books that we believe are inspired by God. We believe it's God-breathed. And the Bible really is a collection of individual books written over a series of thousands of years that tell the same story of redemption and point to the same person, Jesus Christ. It's really incredible when you think about it. It's incredible that this theme of redemption and cleansing and being forgiven of our sins is a consistent theme and a consistent thread throughout the whole scripture. A couple of places that I want to highlight that speak about the same idea that God is able to cleanse us from unrighteousness. He's able to take our sins away. We see in Isaiah uh, 43 verse 25 that God speaks about blotting out our transgressions. God blots them out. He takes them away. He, he removes them. Uh, you know, for some people, he, he uses white out. For others, maybe younger, he backspaces and deletes the sin and failures in our life. Then Isaiah 44 verse 22 speaks about God removing our guilt. God takes it upon himself. And it's amazing. In these two chapters, God is comparing his beauty and his strength and his judgment with idols made of stone or wood or gold or silver. And they can't do anything for anybody. And God says, you're bowing down to them and you're, you're providing sacrifices to them and you're going out of your way to please them, but they can't do nothing for you. But I'm able to remove your transgressions. I'm able to blot them out and delete them and forget them. I'm able to forgive you of every failure and wrongdoing. We see all throughout the scriptures that the idea of forgiveness, the idea of restoration, the idea of purity and being refreshed and clean is a consistent theme throughout the scriptures. It's grounded in the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. But your cleansing and your cleaning and, and your forgiveness is contingent on that we confess. You can't assume you're forgiven if you've never asked for forgiveness. It's just how it works. You, you can't assume that you've been made right with God if you never asked to be made right with God. When we confess our sins, He is trustworthy and has the right credentials to forgive us our sins. Make us pure and refreshed from all unrighteousness. Last question. Maybe the most important question. No good. You can't even see it on the screen here. You can see me circling it on this side of the screen. But uh, it's no good to read the Bible and not apply it to your life. I'm of the persuasion the Bible was not written to you, but written for you. And that's important for us to understand. There's context. There's, there's things that are linked to historical events. Uh, but at the same time, there's something that can be applied to our lives through the whole scriptures. And so the question you need to ask yourself after everything you read is, how does this apply? Is this for me today? Is this for my life? Is this checking my attitude or my actions or my opinions? Is this calling me for a closer walk with Christ? Is this calling me to abstain from sin? Is this calling to me to asking me to live a, a godly and holy life? What is this passage not only saying to me, but how can I put this in practice? How does this apply to my life? And I think this text tonight is very applicable to our lives. I have never met a person who hasn't sinned. I've, I've met some people and I've heard some people who say, oh, I don't sin. But I have never really met a person who doesn't sin. We are all there. And it applies to my life personally because I find confession hard. You know, even though my cup says Mr. Perfect, and I know that I'm not perfect, I like to think that I am. I like to think that I can do it on my own. And if I can just on the scales of life, do enough good, it will cancel out the bad. Confession means I'm admitting I need help. And as a man, that is very hard to do. 
almost as hard as asking for directions. <laughs> I find confession hard, to be honest with you, because it requires me to humble myself. Strip myself down of all my pride. To, to take off the, the pastor badge or take off the husband badge, or take off the son badge and just be Andrew. And sometimes that's hard. But I want to tell you that it's always fruitful. Because when we confess our sins, there's a response waiting on the other side that far outweighs and far out exceeds and, 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 and is so much better than where we find ourselves now. So this applies to me because I know I have a sin problem. But I also know there's a sin solution. It applies to me because I need to learn how to confess more. That's an art that I've lost. There really is an art of confession. It is not in fancy words or eloquent, eloquent speech. The art of confession is the consistency and repetition of the habit. To do it all the time. To come to the Heavenly Father and say, God, I am so sorry with this. I, I've recognized this in my life. Or better yet, pray the prayer that is probably the hardest to pray in the whole Bible. Search me, O God. Know my ways. Look in my heart. Every nook and cranny. See if there be any wicked way in me. I would argue it's the hardest prayer in the Bible to pray. Because it allows God to pull things out and identify things in my life. So how does it apply to me? Well, today I need to learn how to confess better. No, I'm going to confess to God, not on camera. You're not going to hear my dirty laundry today. Nor do I need to hear yours. But I need to learn how to confess better. I need to live a life of confession. Not out of fear and trembling. But out of a desire to be clean. To be refreshed. I mean, have you ever been in a moment where it's maybe a, a really hot day? You know, you know that one really hot day we get in Newfoundland? Like that one day of summer we get for the whole year. And, and some of us miss it because we're working. But I mean, it's hot. It's muggy. If you ever had a vacation or journey down south, you know, the muggy time. And oh, you're sticky. And, and you get a shower. And you come out of the shower and you just feel so refreshed. Wow. Breathes new life into you. Well... There's a refreshing that far exceeds any kind of shower you can take. It's a refreshing of our soul, the resetting of our minds, the renewing of our minds. But when we confess our sins, Jesus Christ is trustworthy. He'll never let you down. You know, I just have a bad habit sometimes, and it's probably only me. That I'll receive an email and I'll see that I received an email. And I'll look at it quickly and then not reply to it. I think to myself, oh, I'll do that later. I'm busy right now. I'll reply to that email later. And sometimes it's days, sometimes hours, sometimes weeks. And I forget to reply to the email. And I feel so bad and I have to type, I'm sorry for my tardy reply. That my, my, my computer can almost type it out now verbatim. I'm so, uh, sorry for my tardy reply. And I go on explaining and, and go on to respond to the email. I'm so thankful that God is not like that. Jesus Christ is not like that. When we cry out, he answers. The book of Mark says this one particular word over and over and over again. The word is immediately. Immediately, Jesus grabbed Peter from the water. Immediately, Jesus did this. Immediately, Jesus did that. When we cry out to him, he hears our prayer. Well, he's faithful and trustworthy. And he has the right credentials to make the right decisions. He's righteous. He forgives our sins and makes us pure, refreshes us, and rids us from all unrighteousness. Today, I'm so thankful for the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross and what it means for my life and what it means for your life. Today, if you have not trusted in him, if today you've put your hope in man or systems of men or anything earthly, I want to challenge you 
and encourage you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Even right now, maybe for the first time, you can confess your sins. And again, there's no perfect prayer for this. It has to come from the heart. Forgive me for my faults and my failures. Make me a child of God. Well, church family, so glad you could join with me tonight in my home, at my table, as you look at this word of God and, and look at this verse. And I want to encourage you, these five questions, you can use them in your own Bible study. I use them in sermon preparation. I use them in my own Bible study. This is something for you to use. Again, the questions are, what words in this passage stand out to me? Number two, is there any repetition? Is something being said over and over again because if it's being said over and over again, chances are it's trying to make a point. Number three, what's the passage trying to tell me? Number four, is there any other place in the Bible that communicates this truth? You would be shocked as you start digging into the Word of God how connected these 66 books are. There are common themes and common trends and common threads that go all throughout the Scripture from beginning to end. And of course, number five, how does this text apply to my life? It's no good to read the Word of God and not apply it. James says a person who reads the word but does nothing about it is like a man who looks in a mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like. It's no use. Why have a mirror if you're going to forget what you look like? Why have a Bible if you're not going to be willing to live by it and do what it says? Thank you for joining me in the Church in the Word. And I want to pray with you now before we finish up. I want to pray that today this verse Oh, what a good book. I encourage you, if you're looking for a book to study or a book to read through now this week in your Bible, read 1 John. It is powerful. It will change your relationship with the Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you tonight for your loving kindness. I'm thankful, God, that you are trustworthy. I'm thankful, Lord, that you have the right credentials to forgive me, to restore me, and to refresh me. Father, even now I confess that which is in my heart and that which is in my mind and ask that you would forgive me yet again that your mercy and grace would flow over me. Lord, I pray for those watching this Bible study that this has been encouraging to them and I pray, O oh God, that you would use this Bible study to deepen their relationship with you, for them to go deeper to who you are and what you want them to become. I'm thankful, Lord, that there is a cleansing which I can receive, not of my own works, but the precious work of Jesus Christ. We thank you tonight for your word. It truly is a lamp unto my feet, a path unto my way. Lord, I want to hide this word in my heart so that I'm not tempted to sin against you. I want to put this word in my heart that it flows out of me and is meat and manna to my soul. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit, which teaches us and applies this word to our hearts. I ask a blessing now on everyone who's watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining with me tonight. And if this has been a blessing to you, feel free to comment in the comment section. And uh, we'll hope to see you next Tuesday night for another Bible study. Maybe next Tuesday we can do this live so that you and I can respond as we go through. It uh, it will be interesting. I think a lot of fun. And so uh, thank you. God bless you. Until we meet again, may God's hand of provision be upon your life and safety be upon your family. In Jesus' name, amen. I am thine, O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it's all I love to be. But I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord. Thou hast died Draw me nearer, nearer, nearer Blessed Lord 
to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul of God with steadfast hope Thy precious bleeding sun.